I know there was one thing that I remember. We were uh, out there, I think it was probably the end of August, and um, a lot of people haven't seen your kind of light mantled and sooty albatrosses, and that's why they come in winter because they want to see these birds because they're amazing. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they don't see them the first time because you don't see them every time, and they don't see them the second time, and they start to become a bit of a bogey bird. So we were out there one day and there was uh, a noted father and son who often come on trips and they were hoping for a light mantled albatross this day. And it wasn't happening and the day was wearing on. And the father mentioned that if I could conjure up a light mantled albatross for him, he would strip off and do a lap of the boat. <laughs> and literally two seconds later, I said, well, here comes one now. And a light mantled albatross came in and flew past the back of the boat. Wow. Uh, it was uh, pretty uncanny. Unfortunately, he didn't actually do it. But Thursday owes me one, and Michael, I expect you to get in, but maybe we can do it in February when the water is a bit warmer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Birding Today podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Dorig. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Um, today's guest has lived in Tasmania all his life, apart from a short stint in Canada, and has always been interested in everything about the natural world. He started birding as a healthy form of procrastination while at uni, and since then has birded extensively across the state, becoming very familiar with the calls, behaviour and habitats of Tasmania's avifauna. Today's guest has organised and led pelagic birding trips from Eagle Hawk Neck since 2012, and occasionally moonlights as a birding guide as well. He is a volunteer reviewer for eBird Australia and moderator for Birdline Tasmania and participates in as many Tasmanian wader counts and by blitzes as possible. So please welcome Paul Brooks on the show. How are you, Paul? Thanks for your time. Good. Thank you, Thomas. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. I'm excited for an interesting discussion because we're heading back down to Tasmania again. Um, the last chat I had, I believe, on the show with a Tasmanian birder was with Karen Dick. Um, so it's nice to go back down there. And I think, um, yeah, Tasmania is an interesting place for birds generally. Um, but before we get into those specifics, the, the core uh, question of the show is, the, is surrounds the joy of birding. So what, what brings you joy in birding, Paul? It's pretty difficult for me to nail it down to one aspect. Um, I really like just being out in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, it's good good for the brain, good for the mind, uh, good for your fitness, especially if you get into some rugged places. Um, and I really enjoy finding different things. So when I'm out birding, I'm not just birding, I'm looking for anything and everything. So that's basically it for me. Yeah. What, what sort of other things do you look for apart from birds? Um, well, I struggle to remember the names of plants. So I'm always trying to uh, uh, update my plant knowledge. So I was looking for different plants that I don't know the names of and trying to find them out. I recently discovered the world of orchids as well. And I can't believe that I never saw them before because once you know where they are and know where to look for them, they're really quite obvious and pretty spectacular um that's been a nice little thing to find out um and my first kind of love in the natural world were small dangerous creatures so little spiders and snakes and things like that so i'm always looking out for spiders and insects and snakes which i don't see too many of unfortunately a lot of people seem to be very worried about them in australia but you don't seem to see that many of them in Tasmania. But yeah, just anything really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I also have that passion as well. It's, it's for, for the general side of nature as well. You know, it's, it's, I, 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 quite, I, I quite like butterflies, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever, especially up here in the tropics, I live in Cairns. So, um, you know, <laughs> we have a good supply of butterflies everywhere. Um, and yeah. whenever, I, whenever I see one... It's like I try and get a picture of it um, to get an ID and then post it on iNaturalist. And so it's and, and that's because birding is, you know, it leads you to these places 
in which there are other forms of life as well, you know, reptiles as well, spiders, as you mentioned. And, and so this, this natural world that we spend time in, how did you first grow into that? And how, how did you grow into, into birding specifically? Um, I suppose the love of nature was always there. Uh, I don't remember anything specific. It was just, it seemed natural to me to be interested in it. And uh, the birding came along quite a lot later. I, I remember, I remember um, always being interested in birds, but never, never actually specifically birding until um, I was at uni. Um, I specifically got into it because I, I was doing a subject where we had to compile a bird list for the semester. <laughs> and, uh, that's still happening, basically. Mm. So I started and kept going. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it keeps going to this day. And um, talk, talk to us a little bit about your, your sort of geographical journey as well, because um, you, you spent some time in Canada as well. Is that, was that a substantial part of your birding journey or? Uh, not at all. No, it was, it was, it was only kind of a bit over eight months. Uh, my partner got a job over there. So we lived there for, we lived in Toronto for six and a half months and then spent a bit over a month traveling around. And I didn't really expect to do a lot of birding over there, but ended up doing a lot. Um, very different kind of birding in North America to what it is down in Tasmania. How so? Well, in um, Toronto particularly, it's it's much more tied to migration, whereas in Tasmania, you have your resident species and then you have your migrants and you're at the end of the flyaway. So they're kind of there for the summer and then they leave in the winter. Whereas in, in Toronto, you've got specific migration windows where you're birding. And then most of the birds that you see, you'll only see them for, who knows, a week, two weeks, three weeks. And outside of that, there, there's resident breeders. And uh, that's in summer, the resident breeders, but nowhere near as many as the birds that pass through to breeding grounds further north. Yeah. And then in winter, you look for ducks on yeah. frozen lakes. <laughs> so there's really, yeah, it's very, very different birding tied to different seasons. Yeah. And quite different to here. You mentioned um, the time window that you can see the mi migratory species. Is it is it th only three weeks? Is that, that seems really... Uh, that was kind of more of certain species only be coming through for a short amount of time. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's kind of from really April through till yeah end of June that yeah. you'll see migrants coming through. That was my experience anyway. It was a very very wet spring when we were there, and I don't, things seemed to be a little bit less normal. But yeah. Thank you for listening to the Birding Today podcast. It's great to have you with us. If you're enjoying the show, don't hesitate to leave a positive review on whichever podcast app you're using at the moment. This really helps with getting the podcast up in search results and reaching more people. Thank you and back to the show. I've spoken to a few US birders and, you know, in, in the US and North America generally, I guess it's like the migration is like an, a big event for everyone, for all the birders, you know, where, which is not something you can say for Australia. You know, we don't have, oh, it's migration time, really. I no. mean, to an extent there is that but it's not it's not as big is it no yeah no you, you just you look forward to seeing the species come back but mm. you don't have to take time off work to make sure you see them because you can't see them in a couple of weeks time kind of thing right exactly exactly and and as you mentioned before tasmania is right at the bottom you know of 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 the whole continent you know it's it's nestled down in the in in, in the ocean as it were and this was one of the questions I had that I wanted to discuss with you is what makes Tasmania unique as a birding destination as such, but also when you compare it to the mainland, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, definitely the isolation, mm. uh, you know, Bass Strait probably plays a fairly big role in the differences in our overfauna. Um, you know, I think, We've got the highest degree of endemism of anywhere in the country, apart from far north Queensland. Someone might correct me if I'm wrong, but you know we have 12 endemics and we have um, two 
breeding endemics, the orange-bellied parrot and the swift parrot. So, yeah, the endemism is high. Um, I think there are less birds overall. I think we've got what they call a depauperate avifauna as well, being an island. So the birding is at times a little bit more difficult. You've got to work a little bit harder mm. to see the birds that you want to see. Mm. Less raptors. You can go around birding for a day and not see a raptor, whereas on the mainland, you, know, you just look up and yeah. you see one kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah, and being the end of the flyway, we might not get quite as many migrants as uh, what the mainland does as well, mm. but uh, high quality ones. Right, and and I think those species that you referred to, the endemics, they they're the main drivers for um, birding tourism to Tasmania, right? Um, that's it. Must be you know, and it, and it's not. It really isn't that far from Victoria. Say it's not. It's not hard to get there, and I, I think that's. I've never been there. I'd love to go. Um, really? Oh no, yeah, I've never, never been there. <laughs> so oh, soon, soon. Yeah, I will. I'll have to come down. Well, um, and and we'll touch on this a little bit later. But I, the, the the seabirds as well, um, the, the pelagic side of things. That's what. That's another clincher, so to speak, of the, of the Tasmanian, you know, richness in bird life. But before we before we get into that, um, I'm also interested in your role as a as an eBird reviewer. Because I've only, I, I, I believe I'm correct, I've only interviewed one eBird reviewer, uh, Kim Farley from the ACT, um, and so that was that, that was a great discussion. So, what, what's what, what does it involve? What's the day to day? Does it take up much of your time? Do you enjoy it? Is it? Uh, yeah, it, it is generally enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of taking up time. Certainly in Tasmania, not so much in winter, because in summer we do get a lot of visiting birders and that swells the number of lists that I see considerably. Um, there's not a massive amount of e-birding done in Tasmania compared to other places in the mainland. Um, but is yeah. that is that just because of the number of birders is, is fewer? Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we see such an uptick in summer because of all the visiting mainlanders and international birders yeah and um they're uh, often the ones that you've got to keep an eye on as well right uh, there are a few tricky birds in tasmania which um the older field guides didn't treat the differences particularly well and you just basically need experience to uh get a good handle on how to separate them so there are there are obvious ones that you have to look out for when there are visiting birders around. Hmm. Because they wouldn't be yeah, that's right. Well, whenever whenever birders go somewhere new, there's always that that newness means that they're not as familiar with the birds and it happens to to to, have, to all, every birder. Um Absolutely. Well, it happened to me in Canada as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially when the farther you go, obviously, that that's the less familiar you get with the local bird life. Um and so that that drives it so do you so does, does most of it involve just sort of reviewing photos or um it's good when you can get photos but you don't always um the eber eber review process is there's a series of filters which cover regions and you can set your filters to catch species that are rare for that particular region and then that will send it to a review queue that you have, and you can have a look at it and ask for more information from the observer if you need it. Um, and also you can trawl through the recent checklists that people have submitted to uh, see if you can see anything that is perhaps a bit dodgy or not correct. Um, and you can search old records as well to uh, see if you can find anything that doesn't look quite right. So it, it can take up as kind of as much time as you want to take up. You can spend a lot of time doing it or you could just focus on what's happening at the moment. But it depends how much time you have to spare some time. Mm, yeah, yeah. And um, I had a question on the tip of my tongue. I've forgotten it now. Uh, oh, I, I can edit this out, but um, what was it? It was a good question. Um, 
No, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to it. Um, and so you're also... Oh, oh, I remember now. Are you the, the um, eBird reviewer for just your LGA or for the whole state? For the whole state, because right. we don't get a lot of lists. Right. Yeah. And we've got, uh, I think there's 29 LGAs in Tasmania, which is a heck of a lot for such a small area. Um, and quite a bit of Tasmania is quite similar. So, yeah, you can, you can get by. I was the sole reviewer for... A, uh, eight years or so and there are a couple of others on board now but uh wow the workload is not huge for us we get yeah. by at the moment yeah that's amazing that you're the sole reviewer for the whole state for eight years that, that's mind-blowing <laughs> uh oh well that's probably a bit of a lie because i think matt from queensland was looking after tasmania as well but uh yeah i was doing most of it right right and and, and that ties in a little bit as well I'm sure over, there's some overlap in being a moderator for Birdline, right? Does that, because I know that, I think only in Victoria, it was Eremea. Was that in Tasmania as well? Yeah, that was in Tasmania as well. And that's mm. how I got into eBird. I started uh, moderating Eremea originally right. back in, I don't know, 2007 or something like that. Mm. And and that's no longer ongoing? Like, Did that translate to Birdline Tasmania? And is that still... They, they were they were both connected and both um, started by the same people. Um, and then Aramea Birds basically merged with eBird. Mm. And the Aramea Bird Lines, which is now Birdline Australia, continued as a standalone thing. Mm. Right, right. Um, and in terms of the, the, the monitoring as well of the, of, of the waders, this is something you're involved in as well. Um, mm. and, and a lot of listeners are, are very much into shorebirds. Um, so, so the Tasmanian wader counts, talk, talk us through that. What, what, what do they involve and, and how, how are you involved in those? Uh, there's, there's a few different ones. Um, there's the Southeast and then the East coast have their own. I've never been able to get to an East coast one. They always seem to have them on weekdays and it's a bit more difficult to get away on a weekday. Um, and there are Northwest ones as well. Um, I've been doing the Southeast ones for the longest because I live in Hobart, that's where it is. Um, I think they have the longest data set of any shorebird monitoring in Australia. That's another thing, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but um, they've been doing it for a long time. I think they've got like 40 years of data or something. Um, the Northwest weight account is most of our favorite one because uh, it's the best place for shorebirds in Tasmania. I first noticed that when I was at uni again, um, there were some posters on the wall where some people had been doing some studies on shorebirds there. And I noticed there were quite a few species they get there, which we don't get anywhere else in Tasmania with any kind of regularity. It's a place that I always wanted to go and check out. And you can't really get there unless you're on the way to count. I mean, you can kind of, you can go there by boat or you can walk across at low tide, but uh, a lot of the islands are um, leased to uh, people who are farming and running cattle and stuff. So you need permission to go out there. So getting there on the way to count was kind of the best way to do it for me at the time. Yeah, it was very exciting to first go up there and see if I could get under some of these birds, which I'd never seen down in the southeast before. Um, and still doing that as much as I can. Fortunately, I don't get to do it every year, but uh, still trying. Well, I guess your main activity and the main core of this, um, of, of, of this episode um, is the eagle hawk neck pelagics. Um, so let's talk about that because it's a, it's a, it's a legendary, it's arguably, would you say it's the best place in Australia for pelagics? I would. Um, I know that some people would argue and probably fair enough. <laughs> um, I know that Southport, uh, get some very good birds consistently and I've been on one Southport trip and it was excellent. Hmm. Um, but I enjoy eagle hawk. Um, so, so what what makes it what makes it so good Do you, ecologically as well as you know logistically? What what does it sort of involve? Because you're you're the main the main man, right? Of the of of, of the trips. Not really? Okay. 
couldn't say that. No, um, there's a lot of different people that um, organise trips. That's the interesting thing about Eagle Hawk that um, people from all over Australia organise trips and come down here and do them. Um, they do occasionally try and get a local person to come on board with them, but a lot of them have been doing it themselves for as long or longer than the locals, so they don't need us basically. Um, but they come here, I suppose, because it's definitely the best place in Australia to see the uh, Southern Ocean specialties in winter. That's excellent. And then in, in summer, we do get some excellent subtropical kind of species as well. Yeah. So we, we get the best of both worlds, I think, um, seasonally. Yeah, yeah. And so there's not only one operator then. How many... How many operators um, go out on, on the Pelagic? Um, well, there's, there's the one boat that does it. There's John Mayles on the Pauletta. He's been doing it for over 30 years, something like that. But, um, you know, there's people from basically every state will come over and organize trips. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you organize one, what what's the starting point? So you obviously got to set a date first and then you've got to get do, do you are you quite hands-on with it and do you help with the boat and like because every pelagic's a bit different everywhere you, you know depending on where you are you know and depending on the weather or the condition of the sea or so you've got lots of different factors how talk us through the steps of, of planning one of these trips if, if if you're the one that's that's heading it yeah it's uh ring up the skipper and see what dates he has available um and these days you've got to ring up earlier and earlier because so many more people are coming down to do them and snapping up the dates um, right and booking a date in and then you know i kind of organize trips for the local regulars um so i'll get in touch with them first and fill up the boat as much as i can for the date and then um I'll often have people contact from other places in Australia, people who've been coming back for years, and sometimes some international type people as well, and basically just fill the boat with whoever else I can mm. and go from there. Yeah, and how often How often is that? How often do you go out? Uh, we try to go out monthly. Okay, yeah, yeah. When's the next one? Uh, three weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. It's definitely, it should be on the bucket list of every Aussie birder, right? Absolutely. Mm. Even if you get seasick, just give it a go once. Yeah. Does that happen a lot? <laughs> uh, it, yeah, usually. There's usually yeah. somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite lucky. I, I always take the, the, the tablets beforehand. And I'm, I'm, I'm usually fine. I've got quite quite steady marine feet. Um, and, and talking of talking at like you know those you, you have best and worst moments you know like do you can you think of of all the times you've been out on an eagle hawk neck pelagic what's been the highlight or maybe you can give me a couple mm -hmm. and then the worst moment um the highlight i don't know there's one thing that i remember we were uh out there i think it was probably the end of august and um a lot of people haven't seen your kind of light mantled and sooty albatrosses and that's why they come in winter because they want to see these birds because they're amazing yeah um and sometimes they don't see them the first time because you don't see them every time and they don't see them the second time and they start to become a bit of a bogey bird so we were out there one day and there was uh, a noted father and son who often come on trips and they were hoping for a light mantled albatross this day. And it wasn't happening and the day was wearing on. And the father mentioned that if I could conjure up a light mantled albatross for him, he would strip off and do a lap of the boat. <laughs> and literally two seconds later, I said, well, here comes one now. And a light mantled albatross came in and flew past the back of the boat. Wow. It was uh, pretty uncanny. Unfortunately, he didn't actually do it. But says he owes me one. And Michael, I expect you to get in. But maybe we can do it in February when the water is a bit warmer. Wow, that's amazing. Those stories, you know, it's it, like, like like you say, uncanny. You know, the coincidences of birding sometimes. And I guess especially in pelagics, that can happen. 
right in your experience uh, for sure mm. yeah. yeah and what about what about a worst moment <laughs> um i can't remember anything specific i think the worst moment is always when you get out there and i think you can kind of tell when you get into deeper water you get a pretty good idea of what kind of day it's going to be like and you can tell if it's going to be a pretty slow one and that's usually the worst moment when you hit the shelf break and nothing is happening and you can tell it's going to be a bit boring and you wished you weren't out there right yeah 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 so that's interesting because just because you 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 come on out from the from the shelf and there's not much happening does that does that often mean that the whole day is going to be the same because it it can do yeah right it's it, it especially seasonally um in summer in particular for a good trip you're kind of almost expecting to see some pterodromas moving south past you kind of midway over the shelf if it's going to be a really good day um if you get out past the shelf and you haven't seen any of that action yet it's often going to be a pretty tough day and summer trips we have less diversity of species so and less numbers often so if you're not seeing that early on it's probably going to be a pretty long day with not much on offer right Which you got to do that anyway because you just got to be out there and you can't win them all but do you did you always go out and maybe it depends on the season and and, and i guess it does vary that the, the timings of the trips like in summer do you go out longer um no always uh apart from in the depths of winter um we do go out a little bit later because it's not light at seven in the morning um but the latest we go out at 7 30 and we're usually back by three and in summer we go out at seven and those times are set by the um, boat operator yeah 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 yeah. a lot a lot of the control is is in the hands of the skipper isn't it in, in... Yeah, definitely and it's good to have uh, somebody so experienced who's been on boats out there for most of his life um, it makes you feel a lot safer because it can get a bit rough out there so it's yeah. good to know that you've got someone who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. yeah definitely and what's the what's the um the frequency of cancellations in is it higher than in other pelagics in in australia lower lower surprisingly than some places um uh, it was probably two years ago i think there were two trips out of a possible 35 that were cancelled oh, wow. yeah. um, there's been a few more this year we've actually had three i think cancelled so far this year maybe four um, might even be four um luck of the draw a bit i guess but it's generally pretty low compared to places like port ferry which uh, can see the weather a bit worse than us i think yeah it's interesting and it's surprising as as you said because I, I, in my mind's eye I, like you know the the ocean off the coast of tasmania surely has to be rougher than on than higher up along the along the mainland but maybe yeah. not well uh if you look at kind of where we're going from we are sheltered from the worst of the westerlies and southwesterlies by the peninsula itself so that really helps out in getting us out there and you look at port ferry that's kind of copying it mm. straight so i guess they see it worse than us And Tasmania itself, as an island, is correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I think this is correct. The west, the western side, the, it's divided in, in in two, and in one wet side on the west, yeah, and and dry on the east, right? Does that affect? I, I mean, it, it must affect the bird life not only, um, you know, when you go out on the pelagics because you're sheltered by the island, but also on the mainland, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, there's a, a quite a different suite of birds in the west than there is in the east. A lot more habitat for your kind of ground parrots and southern emu wrens and that kind of thing. A lot more button grass moorland and heathland and that kind of thing. Orange bellied parrot habitat down in the southwest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's part of the charm for me anyway, and, and potentially for, for others uh, listening. Tasmania is very, what's the word? 
well, especially the southwestern parts are very remote and inaccessible. And I love places like that because it, it adds to the beauty and the, um, it, you know, it really calls you for some reason. Like, is it, is, 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 it, is it as difficult as they say to get around that area, the southwest? Uh, well, to get to somewhere like Melaleuca, you can only get there by plane or boat and walking. Wow. So, the, the, you know, there's no roads to quite a bit of that part of the state. So that is pretty difficult, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I think um, that's a good thing as well in, for, from, a, from a conservation perspective, because roads, you know, if, you, if you've got a road, you've got people going along the road and then and then that's where you start to get the disturbances to, to nature right um so i guess it's a good thing especially with with all the, the, the species that are you know that, that that call call that habitat home like you know the, of course for the swift parrots as well um really really amazing habitat and and, and so and so where is and i guess this is subjective and i've thought about this off the bat but the the best place for birding for mainland birding let's say in tasmania Oh, that's a tough one. Hey, look. Uh, not really. Bruny Island is the best. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, you can see all 12 endemics there. You can get on a boat and go and see albatrosses and a fur seal colony and possibly whales at the right time of year. Um, you know, it takes an hour to drive from one end to the other. And it's uh, excellent for mammals as well. Bruny Island is the best place to go for birding in Tasmania. Oh wow, I love that D direct answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, and well, I, I'd, I'd love, to, like I said, I'd love to get down there. And it's, it's, it's. So, do you think it's an overlooked birding destination in Australia? Um, it could be. I don't know. I don't know what the tourism figures are like. Um, I know that um, the company that I do some work for has had to put on a lot more guides over the last few years, COVID stuff that up a bit, obviously, but um, they've been seeing more and more work. So maybe it's a bit more on people's radar now and they do a lot more pelagics now as well than what they used to do. So I think the word about that is getting out as well. So um, potentially, but I think it's picking up. Mm. Mm. Which is a good thing. Um, and and it's a driver, isn't it, for, for for tourism generally? Like it's it's and like you mentioned, COVID there. Like people are dying to get out and out and about again, you know, and birders as well. Um, and that's that's well and truly sort of rolling rolling forwards. Um, but to take a to take a different angle and a more general angle is this question, which I really am interested in: is what makes a good birder? Mm. Uh lots of different things probably uh i reckon uh conscientiousness is one mm. uh taking into account where you are and maybe doing a bit of research before you go there mm -hmm. this is a, a kind of thing you see as an ebird reviewer is people will claim they've seen some outlandish things where if they had just looked in the field guide at the map they probably would have got the right thing because <laughs> they would have known we only have tasmanian native hens and not black-tailed native hens for instance right so yeah just uh being mindful um is a big thing uh, and i mean there's there's really two sides to that question at, at least two sides um which is the technical side of being a good birder you know, knowing knowing your birds, knowing the calls, um, you know, field ID. And then there's also the, the social side of it and, you know, dealing with, with people and other birders. Um, I, I'm really interested in that. I was thinking about this um, just before, like, because I, I, I do think there is, it's multifaceted. Um, and, and of course, we, it's it's the passion, really, that we're so passionate about birds that it's 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 easy to become emotional, maybe about mm. about them do you have a preference in terms of in terms of group versus solo birding 
Yeah, I burnt mainly solo. Um, yeah. Maybe that's another reason if I enjoy pelagics is because, I mean, you have to have a group when you go on a pelagic. <laughs> um, and it's like the little get together of uh, all my burning friends, I suppose. But um, other than that, it's generally solo. Right, right. Well, the pelagics are unique in the birding world because you know it's like how, how what's by the way what's the maximum sort of what's the normal range, number of people that you have on the boat uh we take 12 as the maximum right right well so that's 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 you know that's quite a handful of people and 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 it's being constrained in a space 12 people on a boat for several hours you know you're going to have there's so many dynamics happening and I guess it changes. Well, it change. It must change all the time, um, depending on how often you get the regulars back, of course. But let's move on to the closing questions, Paul. Um, so the the million dollar question. What's I'll, I'll I'll split it in two. What's your favorite Tasmanian bird? And then your favorite bird anywhere. Right. Um, the favorite Tasmanian bird. This is a. It's a good question. It's one you always get from a non-birder. Whenever somebody finds out you're a birder, they'll say, oh, what's your favourite bird? And it always put me on the spot because I didn't really have a favourite one. And I used to say black-faced cuckoo shrike because it's a pretty cool bird. It sounds cool. It looks cool. And in Tasmania, it usually means that there's half a chance it might be reasonably warm because there are some migrant. Yeah. Um, then I realised a few years ago that the bird that really excites me in Tasmania is a white-throated needle tail because they're, they're kind of, you don't see them all the time. You hardly ever see them in reality. Um, you're kind of waiting for the right weather conditions and maybe you might see them, maybe you don't. But when you do, they're just incredible. They're so big and they fly so fast and there are generally lots of them around and I find that really exciting so I think that's kind of that's the one I'm going to go with from here on in until I find something else great yeah that's it's a great bird great bird and is that so if I expand that do you, do you have any internationally favorite birds or anything that's on your dream list maybe <laughs> um uh there's a few there are some seabirds that I'd mm. like to see. Um, I don't want to name them because some people saw them recently <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> um, they know who they are. And um, I'd really like to see a stellar sea eagle. I reckon they look pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, sea eagles. Yeah. They're the, what, some of the biggest. They're, very, they're huge, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, keeping in the theme of big eagles, I'd love to see a harpy eagle as well, and probably check a Philippine eagle into that as well. Yeah, there's so much potential. Have you have you birded a lot overseas? Not a great deal. No, I did a stint for about a month in South America, oh. and a very small amount in Italy and Greece, just going over for a friend's wedding, and that's about it. Not a heap on the mainland either, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And final question, um, which is, I always like to hear the, the answers to this because um, it gives me ideas as well, is if you had two weeks of unlimited resources, you know, two weeks where you could go anywhere in the world for birding, where would that be? Bruny Island. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. interesting yeah and is that is is that because well that's a big a big statement anywhere in the world um so why is that expand a little bit uh oh, i just love it i've uh, been going there for most of my life and um there are still parts of it that i probably haven't seen as well as i would like to see um and yeah it, I, I love the place yeah yeah excellent excellent well, that's a great no note to end on, Paul. So thanks, really, thanks for your time. And um, I, hope, I hope... Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, well, I hope to come down to, to Tasmania and maybe you can take me out on, on Eagle Hawk Neck. 
Oh, maybe to Bruni Island. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, maybe both. Maybe both. <laughs> All right. Thank, thanks, mate. Thanks for your time. All right, thanks Paul. Thanks for having me. See ya. Bye-bye. <laughs>